faces in the room from you know leveraging Zerto. Uh, we've also got Luke Bradley here as well as one of the territory reps, uh, as, well as, as well as Robert Corcoran, uh, one of our territory reps as well. I think he was just in the room. Maybe I lost him. Uh, and then uh, there you go. They're going to be sneaking in. And then uh, Larry, who's who's one of our SEs in the upper left-hand corner. So you know, if you actually want to know how the product works, talk to Larry. Uh, that being said, kind of do an intro of what Zerto is, where we are in the space, some of the interesting things we're seeing. You know, full transparency is not my traditional deck, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about some things that aren't going to correlate directly to the slide you specifically see, because I like to set a tone for kind of where we are and what we do, um, just as much as talk about, you know, exactly it is what we do. Now, that being said, of course, now the mouse doesn't work. There you go. Let's just skip it. No, that's not working either. Oh, because it's stuck on something. I apologize. Awesome. Uh, so we talk a lot about IT resilience. Um, in large part because disruptions happen. One of the interesting things that's coming up uh, with Gartner is Gartner is actually getting rid of the traditional backup and recovery quadrant. That will happen toward the end of this year. They're moving away from it in favor of what they're going to call IT resilience. Um, and that's really a, a reaction to how they see customers leveraging solutions in that space. Uh, customers less and less are saying, hey, we need to recover data, and more and more are saying we need to stay active and resilient in the face of, of outages and interruptions of service. Um, there's a number of studies out there that talk about how organizations are tr using traditional backup technologies. Uh, most of them tell you about 98% of recoveries come within the first two-week period. After that, the third week is another 1%. After that, it's the other 1%. And that 1% is traditionally legal hold, right? You need the data for X, Y, and Z. I do a lot in pharma and healthcare. You know, uh, radiology imagery is a perfect example of that. Guy gets an x-ray when he's one years old. You need to keep it now for 40 years. Um, the chances of anybody actually trying to go back and get that data is almost nil, but you have to have it. Work with legal. Legal has a very similar, you know, interesting set to that. Now, the thing with Zerto has always been, you know, we never really had a space, to be honest with you, because uh, we never really focused on traditional backup and recovery. We always talked about, you know, near line, you know, near zero uptime and resilience for a whole host of reasons. And it's interesting to see because we're actually seeing kind of the market and, and messaging from Gartner, Forrester, 451, some of these major organizations um, turning into the spin and actually coming over to more of the language that we've been talking about uh, forever. And that language you're seeing change with you know, every traditional backup vendor, with some of the new kind of converged backup vendors, uh, organizations like ourself. Um, and in large part, it's because um, you know, everyone talks about disruptions happen, right? And that's network outages, it's power failures. Um, I've got some pretty funny stories, one of which is a guy falling down in the data center on his way down. He pulled out all the cords. Um, there was a, I won't say who it was, but somebody was going to leave a data center and they just happened to have the emergency off button with the uh, frame protection off right next to the door unlock button. Guess which one he hit? So there are unplanned outages. Things happen, right? The really interesting thing and one of the reasons we talk about IT resilience is more and more most of my customers, the vast majority of them, use us on a day in and day out basis for planned leverage you know, utilization. And that's one of the reasons Gartner is starting to change that messaging because that's how they're seeing organizations leverage solutions in the space. You know, thankfully, knock on wood, we live in a world now where four and five nines is kind of the expectation, whether it's your data center, a cloud provider, whatever the case may be. Um, unfortunately, issues still happen, right? Cyber attacks still, unfortunately, now the most common interruption of service. Uh, but from a day in and day out perspective, you should not have to use DR, right? That's, that's the real hope. Um, but where IT resilience really does come into play now, most of my customers grow through acquisition, right? Consolidating and migrating workloads is a pain in the ass for most organizations. Let's just call a spade a spade, different hardware, different software, different operating systems, different versions of vSphere, let alone different hypervisors. From there, data center and move to cloud, right? A lot of the organizations I work with struggle to adopt a central solution that's going to work. And I'm not just talking about replication. I'm talking about network monitoring security that works in the data center as well as whatever cloud provider they pick. And the vast majority of the customers I work with have multiple cloud providers. Right? So you're talking about how do we consolidate tools? And it's really built around that idea of IT resilience, right? Uh, there's few tools and solutions in place to manage as many things as possible. Now, from a Zerto perspective, kind of a quick history lesson on who we are and, and what we do. Uh, we were founded in 2010 by the former founders of a product called Kasha. Kasha was bought by EMC in 2005. They rebranded it RecoverPoint. Um, I, I liked RecoverPoint when, you know, like when I sold it. It worked really well. When everything was physical, right, when all we had to worry about was things on the LUN, individual LUN-based replication. What we saw when you know, virtualization took off was managing individual VMDKs on LUNs is, again, kind of a pain in the butt, right? 
Most organizations don't structure their applications by VMDKs on individual ones. It's a lot of work um, pre to take care of something in the future. So effectively replicating that data becomes very difficult because we're going to replicate data we may care about, but we also have to replicate data that we don't care about. When we want to recover, we have to recover data we don't care about to recover the data that we do care about. Uh, so effectively in 2009, the former founders of Kasha went back to the market. You know, they talked to their customers and said, hey, we did this once. We did it really well. We want to evolve it. What's the future? How do we improve? The thought process was effectively to move replication, orchestration, recovery out of the hardware layer and into the hypervisor, allowing us to abstract things completely out of the hardware layer, allowing us to license the product by virtual machine so that we can protect data you care about without protecting data you don't care about. That's allowed us to do a number of things. First and foremost, we're an agnostic solution. So we don't care what the underlying hardware is. You know, EMC to Dell, even though they're the same company now, they don't necessarily have solutions that support each other, which is pretty funny. Dell to Pure, Pure to Nutanix, Nutanix to Nimble. Um, additionally, we also support different versions of hypervisor. So every once in a while, I run into customers still running 4.1. It's more common than you'd expect. Uh, we have one of them right now that's going 4.1 to 6.7. So we can actually replicate between different hypervisor versions. Biggest use case for that, migration. Most of my customers are not, thank God, replicating between a 5.5 and a 6.7 for DR for very obvious reasons. Thankfully, very few of my customers are running production workloads that are critical on 4.1 environments for very obvious reasons. Now, that being said, it's a big use case for us, especially migrations in DR. We also support cross-hypervisor replication. So today, we support hypervisor. I'm uh, sorry, Hyper-V and VMware. Uh, next year we will have support for Acropolis. Uh, I said that last year, so I'm hoping next year I'm right. Uh, but that being said, <laughs> it's a firm release thing on our release path. That being said, um, for customers who are looking at Kubernetes, uh, let's have a conversation. We actually already have a, a working alpha. Uh, it works exceedingly well. It's command line. Um, we're going to wrap a GUI around it. We'll have a beta for that, probably more toward kind of the you know, September, October mark. Um, we have customers who are leveraging the alpha today and seeing a lot of successes with it. From a cloud perspective, we support 450 cloud providers. You know, we've got one of them in the room with us as well. Um, there's more of them than I can name. Um, obviously, AWS and Azure being the two largest are hyperscalers. Um, Google, we will have support for this year. Uh, on the East Coast, I don't see it quite a bit. Uh, on the West Coast, we see it a lot more. If you guys are looking, and I mean this honestly, in the room at Google, I'd love to talk about why, where you're seeing it, how you're seeing it being used outside of maybe G Suite on the EDU side. Because um, it's, again, something that I don't have a lot of knowledge based on personally. I um, mean, that being said, really the customer you know, feedback there is we're looking, again, for solutions I can use anywhere. It's a big part of why we talk about our solution set. Now, that being said, sorry, I apologize. Um, typically, our three cornerstones you know, are really our three columns. I know I talked a lot about that wasn't this slide. Um, now, that being said, how do we do what we do and what is it exactly we do? Uh, I like to talk about our architecture when we talk about what our product does. Uh, we are basically two components. Uh, we're a Zerto Virtual Manager. It's an HTML5 GUI. It's a plug-in to vCenter. It gets it from any smartphone, any web browser, anywhere in the world. It's kind of what you'd expect you know, nowadays, right? Lightweight Windows image, um, and you can do DR testing and so forth from a single point. That being said, from a scale perspective, we can have over 220 Zerto Virtual Managers. We've yet to meet a customer that can outscale us from that perspective. The second component is a Virtual Replication Appliance, or a VRA. Now, the VRAs are auto-deployed through the ZVM through an OVF. So if you have a really big environment, we don't have to worry about individually deploying and managing 1,000 VRAs. The VRAs themselves are a lightweight Debian Linux appliance, usually consuming less than 1% of resource. And the power of Zerto is our scale. We scale both horizontally with the virtual replication appliances and vertically. So we can add CPU and memory, depending on the workloads you're looking to support. A lot of SQL databases, you know, affinity rules set up a specific host or a database cluster. We can support those and still deliver those near zero recovery points objectives. Perfect example of our scale, you know, what, what's one of our principal competitors, EMC? What's their SAP cloud provider services? Anyone know? It's VirtuStream. VirtuStream, right? Thousands and thousands of VMs. Guess what they use instead of their own product? They use our stuff. Got a PO from them yesterday. Um, they use us, and it's, it's because of our scale and our power. And also our agnostic you know, nature helps quite a bit as well. Uh, the VRAs, like I said, handle replication site to site. Um, now, the replication, uh, I always like to talk about what we're not before I talk about what we are. It's really important. Um, we are not LUN-based replication, and we're not snapshotting. So because we're not snapshots, there's no degradation of performance, right? 
Uh, snapshots are like Polaroids. It takes a little bit of time to develop a Polaroid. It stuns the virtual machine or the group of VMs. It's one of the reasons you have to stagger snapshots. It's the big reason vSphere replication has always been not good, in my opinion. A lot of people share that opinion. But that being said, the other big inherent issue with snapshots, of course, is you're chewing up a lot of bandwidth anytime you try to send a snapshot, and you, you absolutely lose application consistency because you can't group snapshots close enough to provide that level of consistency. Now, because we're not LUN-based replication, not to sound cavalier, but we don't care how VMDKs are configured on LUNs. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the limitations from a granularity perspective of LUN-based replication. You also can run into some degradation of performance of the application. Typically, you have an RPO issue relative to the bandwidth you're trying to push across because, again, you're not replicating as granular as most organizations would like. Now, the way that Zerto replicates is effectively we capture writes as they're being written from a protected VM and only protected VMs to a VMDK and create an auxiliary write to one or multiple locations. Now, we're basically in the I.O. path. And because we are, we're able to get RPOs of between 5 and 15 seconds. I have a number of customers who have you know, a pretty healthy bandwidth between data centers. They're getting RPOs of 1 and 2 seconds. We will never be zero, but if you give us enough bandwidth, we can get pretty damn close. Now, that being said, all of those individual points of replication are being st ugh, stored at the target side. And again, you can replicate to multiple locations. Uh, many of my customers actually replicate locally as well as do a disaster recovery site because they do a local replication for near-term recovery, file-level recovery, uh, and then they do ultimately the DR for longer-term retention as well as actual DR operations. But our journal works very similar to a DVR. If you know how a DVR works, you know, knowing it's half the battle. Effectively, we're keeping points of replication, let's say, eight-second increments for up to 30 days. You can set an SLA from one hour up to 30 days. If you think of 30 days times an eight-second increment, you end up with about 400,000 points of replication. And we'll talk about what you can do in, in all of those things. Now, I know I talked a lot. Any, any questions at all whatsoever? Call me a name. Yes, sir. I missed that. How many of your ACs? Was it per host? So it's one per host. Per host. One per okay. host, yeah. And uh, so basically, uh, with a virtual replication appliance, big reason for that is, is we can track VMs as they move through the environment. So whether it's DRS, you know, load, uh, turbonomics load balancing, vMotioning, we play nicely with, with everything. So they end up just setting up rules so they don't get vMotion? Yeah, visible? exactly. Yeah. And the VMs move <laughs> off, you know, naturally when we do maintenance and all that fun stuff. Awesome. Going easy on that. I like it. Oh, yes, sir. So, so it is, it's a Zerto GUI. Most of our customers use the Zerto GUI. I mean, I think that's a move that most people are making. Uh, we have a vCenter plugin, so if you wanted to manage it through vCenter, you have the ability to do so. Uh, if you want to do it through command line, you, have the, you could do it, theoretically. I wouldn't suggest it, but yeah, you could. Um, yeah. Uh, and it's basically, uh, all, well, more technical, but all the Zerto virtual managers basically have their own, you know, call it GUI. They're all interfaced and managed through, you know, a single, single portal, but obviously you can you know, you get the gist. Now, from a journal perspective, you can do all the things you'd expect to have a backup product with our journal. File level restores, database restore, restore an XML file from a database, uh, the whole nine yards. Uh, the two questions I traditionally get about Zerto is you're replicating so aggressively if I have a corrupted database, let's say, when I go to recover, don't I recover into a corrupted state? That's a limit limitation of most near-term or near-sync or synchronous solutions. I used to sell SRDF. Customers loved us when they first got it in. The very first time they had something of, of a corruption, they hated us because they had to go to a backup. The backup was like 24 to 48 hours old, and they were like, well, what was the point of using SRDF? <laughs> That's a great question, Mr. Customer. Why do you ask? Um, that being said, with Zerto, it's not an issue. And the reason for it is, is we can recover the database back to seconds before the corruption. Not only that, but we can guarantee it's going to recover into a crash consistent state prior to committing that recovery, whether in the traditional data center or at a secondary site. To take that a step further, we can provide application consistency for all of the front end or middle end, or sorry, middle applications that support, or that are supported, I should say, by the database. And we'll talk about how. The bigger question I get, unfortunately, knock on, I hope this is wood, not balsa wood, um, is can you help me protect from things like cyber attack? Um, you know, unfortunately, I can't tell you you've been exposed. If I could, I'd have an island by now. Um, that being said, what we can do is greatly diminish the amount of data loss and downtime. The biggest issue companies face today when they get exposed is they were hit two or three weeks ago. They didn't realize it, and the, the best they can recover from is a full backup that's weekly. And in a lot of cases, if you're exposed 22 days ago, your last backup is 
either 20 to 28 days, or I know some organizations who only keep two, two weeklies. So their last full is a monthly. And that monthly might be might not even be 30 days. Yes, sir? Is the uh, ability to recover from a, uh, a breach uh, noted when the saw, what, what version of the backup has actually been in, in practice? Like, can you determine by looking at your journal where it happened? Do so, you notify you, otherwise, you have to go back and just. Well, so, so there's a couple of really good answers in there. We can dive in deep. So yes and no. Uh, so one of the things we talk to a lot of organizations about, before you put a new patch or a code upgrade to a specific application, mark it in the Zerto journal. You can actually tag it. What we're seeing with a lot of organizations is, is you know, AD a couple of years ago had a zero day, and they basically had to go back to prior to the, to, to the patch or upgrade to get out of the zero day. A lot of organizations were affected by that. We're, we're in the virtual environment, so you're probably not using us for AD. But it's a good example. We've seen that with some other things. You know, Struts 2 for a while had a, had a known exploit within a certain versions of Struts 2. If you want a Struts 2 application, you could rewind it prior to that specific patch or component upgrade with Zerto. Unfortunately, within Zerto itself, if, you know, let's just say for, you know, eDiscovery gets hit, like as an application, we won't know specifically that eDiscovery got hit at X point. What we do very well and what customers traditionally do with us is layer on monitoring and reporting solutions like a QRadar or a Splunk or Tenable. Some of the solutions you would traditionally use, they'll use us and they'll stand up the application at, in an isolated environment, basically quarantined off. They'll run those tests against it to make sure they're recovering into a non-exposed state. The big difference is, as opposed to going back to a 30-day backup to do that, we can go back to 22-day, four-hour, and two-minute. Um, and basically what, what ends up happening with a lot of our customers is, is they go back to a point in time and then they try to work backwards to figure out when they were exposed. And that helps them do a lot of triage to figure out what the exposure was. A lot of our customers also do that to build logs so they can do a better job of finding out about the exposure next time before it actually gets called into action. The other big piece of that is we're orchestrating the recovery. So we're actually bringing those applications online in an application consistent state. We talked about snapshots before. I won't, won't say who it was. It's, it's, at the time, wasn't one of our customers. Uh, they were in Jersey. They were down for three weeks. Probably not hard to figure out who it is. They were all over the paper. They even talked about how much money they lost. Uh, their biggest issue was they didn't have a full backup of any of their environment. I mean, you're talking about thousands of virtual machines, petabytes of data. So basically what they had to do was cut and, and piece, you know, forensic-wise, data forensic, applications back together in order to get back online. A lot of organizations who leverage snapshots or SAN-based replication, that's a big pain point, right? Just finding a point of time to recover into that the application is going to operate or function correctly in. Yes, sir? So I, I, so, you know, full transparency, I, I, I deal with a lot of, like, you know, Fortune 100 customers. And nowadays they're trying to go back as far as storage will allow them, as much budget as they can throw toward retention. Um, so it's a, I'm in a little bit of a unique situation. The vast majority of our customers keep about two weeks on the journal to give them that level of granularity. My recommendation is always if you can get away with, if with, from a storage perspective, right? You can afford to keep it longer, do it. Nowadays with, with um, uh, sorry, DDoS-based storage, it's even easier to do. And you know, I would say keep three to four weeks because you know, that's what we're seeing Gartner kind of recommend, as granular as you can be for that period of time. With the Zerto long-term retention, we can store the data indefinitely. And we're starting to see that take off a lot more as well. Wherever you want to put it. Yeah. So in the data center, you know, you can you can target whatever your traditional storage, you know, DR array is. You can also target tier two storage. So it's it's wherever you want to throw it off to. Only thing we don't support natively is tape. So we'd have to use like a Falcon store or something as a media server. And I'll be honest with you, I hate tape, so I'm not really that upset about it. Um, we also support AWS, Azure, and a whole bunch of cloud providers. Too many of them. It's the world. There's a lot of cloud providers in the world today. If you're already doing differentials, though, how well does it be So if, if you're doing differentials on, on what? On another well, product or was there a... So basically, well, true, but there's still a, a bit of redundant data. So basically, our, our journal, not to get in the weeds too much, works very similar to how, how date, uh, data domain dedupes. So basically, we're keeping a hash table. So we're actually able to eliminate a number of the hashes because we're, we're, we're tracking them. But to your point, you're not going to get three or four X dedupe. Sure. You know, you're going to see a half, one and a half maybe. Um, and again, a lot of that time, especially in like a SQL environment, you're replicating some redundant data anyway. There's also some stuff we can do with regards to things like tempdb, where we don't replicate temporary files. That saves a ton of disk space. So 
there's a, again, we, we get into the weeds quite a bit there. The other big difference there between us and, for instance, like a traditional array solution, now we're talking, getting in the weeds a little bit, is traditionally you have to pre-provision landing space, especially with snapshots. 25 to 35%. If you have a big SQL environment, 50%. Um, Zerto doesn't pre-provision anything on the source of the target. So on the source side, we're usually saving somewhere between 50, or sorry, 25 and 35% of storage. If you're a high change rate database environment, again, that's going to be bigger. On the LUN replication side, usually 15 to 25% of storage costs. Awesome. There you go. So we talked about application recovery. This is my dummy slide. I like it because it, I'm a visual guy. Um, applications nowadays are made up of more than one VM. Again, a lot of my customers, homegrown apps are, are wide. They're not so deep, but man, they're wide. They're full of all kinds of fun stuff. Um, and trying to protect them is very difficult because they usually span more than just ownership. What I mean by that is your database guys have their policy and it's their thing. Some of the app teams have their own policy and it's their thing. Oracle and, and SQL guys usually have kind of their differing opinions on how they need to do things. It's just the way it is. Tying that all together in a single solution is very difficult. Zerto does a very good job of it. And effectively, what we do is we use what we call virtual protection groups, or a VPG. Now, a VPG can be created of one VM. It can be created of over 10,000 VMs. Most customers do it by application. I hope there's nobody in here who's really, really big on SharePoint, because I'm about to pick on SharePoint. I hate SharePoint. I managed SharePoint for a short period of time. I had to use it. Uh, it's great when it's a blank canvas. It's really good in 365. Um, very difficult. And I'm just not a fan of the data center, sorry. But you guys probably know, right, SharePoint. You know, SQL, SharePoint, and a front end. When you protect SharePoint, you need to do two things. Right order fidelity and application consistency. Smart ways of saying you're replicating all of those VMs at the same point in time. And the reason for it is, is if SharePoint is out of clock with SQL, it'll blue screen when you can recover it. It won't work. It just won't know what to do. It's a very finicky application. A lot of homegrown applications in the data center are the same way. A lot of us manufacturers make products that are the same way. It's, you know, I, think, I think some manufacturers do it to blame it on the customer when it doesn't work. That being, <laughs> now, that being said, we can provide that within our virtual protection groups. We also have the ability to create a boot order of the virtual machines within a VPG. So again, with SQL, you have to bring up, oh, sorry, SharePoint, you have to bring up SQL first, then SharePoint, and then your front end. Any other order, SharePoint will blue screen. It's just the way it is. So we can actually create that boot order within the VPGs. We create a hierarchy of VPGs. Um, I do a lot of life sciences um, legal, financials, they all have varying different versions of what is mission critical to them. Legal, e-discovery, and email is usually the first thing on. Healthcare, traditionally Epic or you know, EMR systems. Um, in pharma, distribution. Their biggest concern is how do I get drugs out of the building? They're not even more that, more, that worried about manufacturing it a lot of times. Everyone's a little bit different. You actually can set the hierarchy, tier zero, tier one, tier two, tier three, to make sure you're bringing applications back online as they meet the criticality to the business. We talked about the journal. You were say something? Sorry. No, I was going to oh. say that's an interesting thing, but you said that the distribution. Uh. Yeah, we can talk about their VR plans and manufacturing is so different than what we are. They, they, that's their revenue, the revenue driver. It's, yeah. It's, I, I thought it was going to be, you know, people working. They're like, no, we don't give a shit about that. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, a, they're a fixed, they're a fix, they, consider, they consider people a sunk cost. Yeah. You know, they're going to pay you to do whatever you're going to do anyway. Yeah. But the drugs, if we, if we don't get them out, if CVS calls us and they're, they're waiting on stuff, we get sued. You know? okay. Yes, sir. When you can have two targets yeah. for your, uh, let's say, VPG groups, but one of the targets could be my journal long-term retention mm -hmm. and the other one is just my high availability. Yep. Yeah. So what we're seeing, in, you know, good use case. I was talking about in the cloud. What I'm seeing with a lot of my customers is they're leveraging hyperscalers for, for a multitude of things. One of which is the the excuse my French, but it's the oh shit moment. So one of my pharma customers, it's AstraZeneca. Um, they're a published use case now. They replicate to AWS, Azure, and several data centers. One of the reasons they use AWS and Azure is they're they're pretty pretty well geographically distributed. But one of their applications specifically is is almost entirely in the East Coast. And they believe if they, if they lose the East Coast, they still need to be able to ship drugs. And they'll probably need to ship even more of them because they just lost the East Coast. So they kind of call it the scorched earth thing. My, my, my good friend over there is like, I'm more worried about where my wife and kids are doing because they're in, they're in Charlotte. But 
Yeah, in, in the event of that, we're going to go to AWS or Azure. The other big use case for that around is cyber. So this is more of a business thing than, than it is IT. Uh, but when you offset some of your risk off to an AWS or an Azure from a cyber recovery perspective, if AWS or Azure is exposed, you get to push off the limit of liability onto the cloud provider. Yeah. You make them a part of paying your, uh, your bill uh, or your premium for insurance, whatever the case may be. So, yes, sir. Um, how about SAP? Is there anything special with SAP and replication? So, yes and no. Again, I hate to give like, mixed answers. So, we're virtual only. Um, a lot of my customers, you know, SAP HANA specifically, are running in a, in a physical environment right. due to licensing and, and, you know, operations. For customers who do virtualize SAP, it's as long as it's a VM, yeah. it's, yeah. yeah. And then... Yes, sir. There's been conversations about it. Um, you know, candidly, what we're seeing with a lot of customers is they're, they're, there's more of a push to get away from. Even Oracle is now creating more of a licensing model to get you to virtualize stuff on OVM. Right. But even then, they're, they're so yeah, they're, they've been much more responsive, especially now, you know, the purchase of Red Hat to allowing you to do things on VMware um, because of some of the relationships that are in place. They know they're going to get their money out of you somehow now. Um, so it, it's... It really just never taken off. Um, the other big piece of that is a lot of our customers will talk about our orchestration within a lot of those physical environments have a solution like DataGuard that we can actually interplay with. Um, so, we, you know, yeah. Well, and the, the reality is in some of those physical environments, it's just cost prohibitive to ever virtualize it. Or it's sitting on AIX and it's just, you know, it's never going to go anywhere. I mean, you're never moving it probably, right? You buy more gear every four years, thanks. <laughs> and we're not, we're not, at that point, we wouldn't even be able to support that with an agent anyway. So. Well, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll have a, a physical SQL server and yeah. you know, that gets changed, and yet you have to you know, yeah. back it up. Yeah. 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 Well, and we, 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 there's some stuff we do around that that we can talk about, you know, relative to SQL level re replication or if you're doing things like log shipping, you know. Um, last thing I'll mention here, from a retention schedule perspective, uh, no matter how many sites, no matter how many VPGs, you can get a, set a different retention schedule on the journal by individual VM, by VPG, by group of VMs, however you see fit. You know, for some stuff, 30 days makes sense. For something that, you know, is a file server somewhere, you may not want to keep 30 days. All depends. The other big piece here that talks about, you know, that I talk about quite a bit when we talk about, you know, how we compare to other solutions, where is granular from a recovery standpoint is a single virtual machine. So you can recover a single VM out of a VPG, a group of VMs, a VPG, a group of virtual protection groups, any level of granularity you want. The big use case to that is not just DR. You know, it's testing net new release of product before pushing it out to production. It's testing an application to see how it's going to run in a cloud provider or in a new environment on new hardware. Uh, so it kind of broadens the scope beyond just traditional, you know, IT resilience. So, so you could so you could create like a zero day rule, for instance, if you wanted to move a journal off into Glacier. You know, the the real limitation of that, candidly, is for us. You know, it's we're talking about a lot of IT resilience now from a file level restore perspective. There'd be a play there, but with the way you have to schedule Glacier, it's just not traditionally convenient for customers to keep because a lot of most of my customers are doing DR to the cloud more than you know just backup. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be that convenient because then you'd have to wait for Glacier to hydrate the data. The other limitation you have on, on Glacier, which you guys probably know, is there's a limitation of throughput of how much data you can pass over a period of time. If you try to do true DR in those workloads, a lot of the data is living in Glacier, you're going to time out. You'll never get the data back because you're talking about now recovering hundreds of terabytes or maybe not. depends on the size of the environment, right? Now, from an orchestration perspective, we are a fully orchestrated solution. Time it takes to spin up a VM, time it takes to recover. I used to say it took us like 30, 40 seconds five years ago. Flash accelerated storage has changed everything. A lot of my customers are Flash, whether it's EMC, Unity, VMAX, Pure Storage does an amazing job, Nutanix, everyone nowadays is changing the game. You're talking about spinning a VM up in 10, 15 seconds. You know, the longest piece of it is the indexing in VMware, and that's not really storage's fault. Now, that being said, we're talking about wide-scale application recovery, again, in the very low minutes. And in that, we're doing things like IP changes, DNS. We also support pre- and post-recovery scripts. I mentioned that earlier. The biggest use case for me there is Oracle DataGuard, as I mentioned. We can actually ingest the data points from DataGuard into our recovery process to provide consistency in that, even though we're not doing the replication. We've got some pretty, good, pretty big customers, MetLife, Cigna, 
um, who are doing that, a couple other pharma customers who aren't referenceable. Uh, so it tends to be a big, uh, big use case for us. Now, candidly speaking, most of our customers, thankfully, use us more test than, uh, than in production. Uh, I would really like to see nobody use our product for the actual DR. I don't want to see anybody have any outages just being candid. Now, that being said, from a testing perspective, we support live and isolated test environment. I'm running into more and more people who do live failovers over the weekend. Um, for one of my customers, particularly um, in the insurance industry, it was, it was two days, and by two days, I mean it, it always crawled into Monday, so they always had to take a maintenance window on Monday. And uh, it took a little over 40 people, and it was, uh, it was a hair puller. It was pretty stressful. It was about 1,000 VMs, uh, a lot of database stuff. We were able to shrink that down into a single Saturday. Actually, it only takes them about half a Saturday now, and then the application guys spend the rest of the day testing to make sure things work. Now, that being said, the vast majority of my customers do isolated testing. Set it up in an isolated bubble. We don't, we don't have to have any shadow VMs or anything sitting over there waiting. We spin them up during the test. Now, that being said, it's non disruptive performance. We don't break replication. I actually had a customer had a network outage when they were doing a test. They actually had to do a real failover during their test. Yeah. All they did was gracefully shut down the test environment, didn't take very long, and then do the actual failover. So they were, they were very sharp on what to do because they were just testing it. Um, now, that being said, that test environment is where we're seeing a lot of those things we talked about earlier. You know, leveraging our clone VMs to do monitoring, to, uh, to run patches against, code upgrades, fire to pushing to production. I have a lot of customers who are getting real world costs and what it's going to look like to move an application to an AWS or an Azure leveraging the cloning and isolated feature because uh, they just run it in parallel with what they're doing to production. Uh, from a move operations perspective, it's a big use case for us. Um, and that, that, oops, that, uh, that testing environment does a great job of allowing you to move an application, whether between different hardware platforms to a new, op, or sorry, to a new uh, version of uh, a VMware, um, or effectively to a new data center or a cloud provider, and make sure that it's going to work prior to committing the failover of the application. From a Zerto perspective, we greatly decrease, oh, look at that, greatly decrease the number of steps as associated with migration. We, are, we all, well, sorry, orchestrate all of it, cutting out the need to shut it down, manually sip a snapshot, mount a snapshot, do the whole nine yards to bring it up. You know, a good example there with one of my financial customers, we took a three-day maintenance window down to a little under two hours. Um, pretty big. We allowed them to go from doing 100 VMs in basically three days to doing close to 500. And then last but not least, bringing the data back. Uh, all it is is a reverse replication. It's a delta sync. From there, we're going to do a move operation to bring the workloads back into the data center. Painfully simple. Any questions before I talk about cloud? Yes, sir. Sorry, 100%. Exactly. Yeah. And all based on the GUI itself. Awesome. Pretty simple. So, yes, sir. You mentioned we, uh, we help do this. So you, you know, the consulting side. Do you, like, you know, customers may not be running Zerto in their, you know, in their on the prem and in their environment, mm -hmm. but they might want to do a test once a month. Do you come in and do that? Uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, customers, we're, we're perpetually licensed traditionally, so the customer is going to own it in his data center. Um, I used to say we because it's like a group. We're all one family. Um, we do have a professional services arm that can, that can assist with implementation. Candidly speaking, if I sold that to you, I'd be stealing your money. I mean, a guy over there has used our stuff. It's painfully simple. He can probably tell you about it. Um, I, I stood it up in my lab. If I'm able to do it, anybody's able to do it, we'll just be honest here. Um, where we see the professional services is usually around things like scripting, so some of the additional things. We have integrations into ServiceNow, for instance. That's a big one. You know, customers want to create self-service portals. Um, a lot of my customers are turning IT into a profit center and pushing it back to the business or the lines of business. So that's usually where we see services more than anything else. So, uh, so from a cloud perspective, um, not pictured here is we actually support uh, VMware on AWS as well as VMware on Azure. Uh, so good to know. Um, the Zerto logo down there uh, is our Zerto cloud providers. They basically have exactly what you have in the data center. And then IBM, who I candidly don't do much with. Um, but, you know, again, interesting to hear how you guys feel about them. I get mixed feelings all the time. For AWS and Azure specifically, it's where a lot of our conversations resigned. Um, the architecture is pretty straightforward. It's a marriage of the ZVM and the VRA into what we call a ZCA. Um, and the number of Zerto cloud appliances required is entirely based on the amount of data you're pushing, the number of applications you're replicating, you know, the basic stuff, right? 
uh, how much that throughput is. It's kind of a math problem on how we need. Key takeaway here is it's not one to one. So for instance, one of my customers who was currently doing um, the traditional availability uh, in Azure, you know, region west coast, region east coast, global lo load balancers, global tra or local traffic managers writing data to both sides, we were able to shrink the number of instances required um, by 140. Uh, we saved them a little over $16,000 a month by moving to us. And we gave a better RPO and a better RTO, and we removed all the manual process out of it. Now, replicating into AWS and Azure, biggest question I get is, hey, I'm a VMDK in the data center, and Azure, for instance, is a VHD. Those, they don't, those things don't work. Um, so we actually convert from a VMDK into a VHD as we land in Azure specifically on blob and page blob storage. So we're actually converting that workload. What that means is when you go to recover, we don't have to do that post-process. So if you compare us to like a backup product, like let's say a Commvault, Commvault's landing a VMDK when you go to recover, then then pushing it through their media agent and converting it to a VHD. It's not that big a deal when it's a terabyte. When you times that by 10 or 100, you actually magnify the time by greater than that. Um, we're doing that as a multi-threaded process when we go through the recovery. Traditionally, we're seeing recovery times in the cloud competitive with what we see in the data center. So you're talking about RTOs of minutes. Uh, big use case, again, migrations. Big use case, DR. Biggest use case lately, third copy of my data in the event I get, I get hit in the data center. I'm data center to data center. I love it. But in the end, same network. I want to push it off to somebody else's network. There's still connectivity. The data may still end up there. But I push the responsibility off on somebody else just as myself. Pretty interesting. We see a whole bunch of use cases to cloud. I mean, there's, they're near endless, which you guys probably know even better than I do. So this is our GUI. Uh, it's actually changed since this slide. Again, this is not my slide deck, so I apologize. I think it's prettier now. It's right. It's nicer now. Yeah, it's, it's better. See, he's got it up. Um, I have a customer who used to call this his coffee cup slide. Uh, he was a CIO for a, fine, uh, for a credit union. He'd come in, and he would just make sure everything's OK. Everything's green. He'd go about the rest of his day. For Zerto, recovering is really as easy as three clicks. This is one part that hasn't changed. Is oh, Did I break it? Maybe you don't click. Oh, that's weird. You know, it's because it's, it's not popular. There we go. We click failover. We select the application we want to recover. We click the point in time we want to recover into. And then from there, we begin the failover. Uh, test and live operations are exactly the same. What I skipped over here is a lot of the minutia that you have, like the ability to set up auto failovers, auto fail back, reverse replication, and a whole host of other things. Now, one of the outcomes of this is the following document. A lot of my customers everywhere, not just the ones I cover now, risk management compliance is becoming the fastest growing part of their organization. And they're more and more being asked to not just say you can do it, but actually document you can do it. Documenting it is a pain in the butt, especially if it's a manual process. It takes a lot of guys in a room together. This actually shows a number of things. It shows your SLA, so recovery points objective, recovery time objective. It shows you the run book that went into recovering an application as granular as each individual virtual machine and the step that went into that, whether it be indexing a VM or so forth. It shows you what was successful. That's great. The most important here, thing here is it showed you at a very granular level what failed during the recovery, what failed in that boot order. Biggest reason that's important to me is I want to triage what went wrong, and the last thing I want to do is that break-fix scenario of, well, let's do this step. No, let's do this step. No. You do that manual, it takes a really long period of time. You know, we, we all know that, right? Um, now, that being said, the vast majority of times we run into issues, it's network connectivity. It's always the network guy's fault. Or um, I said that once in a room full of network guys, I got a really dirty look. <laughs> really dirty look. Yeah, really dirty look. Um, it's either that or with virtual protection groups, it's a VM should have been a part of an application that you never even knew about. And that helps you find that out. We run into that more and more in larger organizations. Some VM is in a closet somewhere, and somebody's threatened to turn it off forever. But nobody ever lets them do it, and they don't know what it does. We do a tailover, and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, yeah, it's part of our e-discovery environment. Did you know that? I didn't know that. So. So we've talked about basically everything up the stack. The last thing I'll talk about, and then I'll get off the, my high horse, I promise, uh, is Zerto Analytics. Um, this is becoming more and more um, a big conversation for us, especially with our, our customer base who are managing multiple environments, who are leveraging the cloud. We're collecting a ton of data in the environment. CPU utilization, memory storage consumption, bandwidth consumption. 
Um, and pushing that out to customers in, I would say, an actionable fashion is, is critical. Uh, so we're actually able to do this as both a, uh, sorry, as a SaaS offering. Uh, it's, it's not, sorry, it's read-only. So you can hand it back to the business. You can actually operations guys look at it. They can see the SLAs. They can do things like that. The bigger piece of that is we can help you estimate what cost of consumption will be for a workload in the cloud, what the cost of consumption is in the data center if you're doing chargeback, as well as what future bandwidth considerations are going to be needed, what storage consumption is going to be required, CPU utilization, and the whole nine. You know, for some of our customers just in the data center, it's a way to get an estimation of what it would look like if we did extend the journal to take advantage of that. You know, can we really afford that from a storage perspective? For a lot of my customers, it's, I'm thinking about moving this workload to the cloud. What's it actually going to cost? Uh, we're in the environment, we're actually see, be able to see that data rate of change. We're, provide, we're able to provide great telemetry into what that's going to look like. And again, it's not just for IT, the business, a lot of our customers use it as well. This is also a platform that if you're risk management compliance, people want you to do reporting, don't do any more reports for them. You don't need to, just hand them this, they can see it. They can do it themselves. Well, that's all I got and I'm sticking to it. And, uh, yes, sir. One more oh. point on that last one. So you had mentioned earlier about you know sizing the cloud numbers and scales and stuff like that. Part of that information can come from the planner part of analytics, right? And so that'll help you figure out as you're growing and making more good stuff, how many more ZCAs you need to deploy or that type of thing. So you can, you know, we're we're helping you size. We're not making you go through like spreadsheets and Z first and all this other stuff. You know, That's right. More than you need. Huh. Well, it'll it'll it'll, 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 it'll yeah show you all the all the data that because we're actively collecting and monitoring that data. Mm -hmm. So the one point there as an MSP when you're trying to really size up how many local CPU and, and how much RAM you really need to run that app, if somebody can put a system in and a sized up or four times what you're doing on it. And if I build out a uh, recovery reservation environment for that production environment, it's going to cost 50 times more than it should because the app doesn't want to do that for one. Well, remember, I'm talking about we're helping you size out your Zergo environment, your ZDR. Right, right, so I'm saying you can do that also for whether it's, like the, this analytics tool, that can tell you what it's really using requirement or how many CPUs it really takes to make that problem. So validation test. If I do a DR test, So it, what we can help you do is size out what CPU storage requirements would be needed at the disaster recovery site. But from a utilization perspective, you know, spot on. It, there's, there are better tools for that. Yes, sir. If I got it right, if I'm already in my third O and I have a seven-day journal. Yes, sir. And I say, he just advised me, I should really have a 21-day journal. I can go in here, put in the 21, and you'll size with it's going to kind of predict it what my 21-day journal is going yep. to be, and then I can multiply it by like a million dollars. And <laughs> <laughs> then you can go to your boss and be like, give me money, huh? <laughs> but that, that's the concept, right? Yeah, that, yeah, that it's can, spot on. We can experiment with how to improve our uh, replication, and this will kind of give us a... Exactly, it'll, it'll be give a sense of what that retention is going to look like based on the rate of change in the application as it's seen over 90 days. Yeah. yeah. No. Nope. Okay. So the, the only you limit. You just have to turn it on. There's a click button that, because part of it involves a, a, a yeah. volume that you use a click button. Well, yeah. well, wait. So, so just so full transparency, yes and no. So if if you leverage a cloud provider, none against you guys, um, then MyZerto Analytics isn't available to you only because yeah. only because you'd be able to see everyone's environment yep. um, because it's yeah. So. But we can have our cloud provider. Well, you could. They, they'll yeah, you, and you can, exactly, you can work directly with them to know, to, to know what that looks I like. I can have all my journals have different, I mean, all my uh, VPGs have mm -hmm. different journals. Yep, yeah. And we, we see that a lot. Some of, some of my customers specifically who have a fear within certain parts of the environment but are a little, you know, Larry mentioned this earlier on the pharma side, they're a little, I don't want to say willy-nilly, but a little less aggressive, um, draconian on, uh, on other parts of the environment. They'll do 30 days in their critical apps, and then the other ones will be like, oh, I got a day. You know, after that, 
Yeah, exactly. You know, my SLA is 48 hours. It is what it is. So it, every everyone's different, but. So by and large, you're going to have, you know, uh, you're not going to replicate the domain controllers. Traditionally, they're, they're on the secondary site. More often than not, you're running a physical domain controller. Uh, um, or that's traditionally what I see. I mean, Larry might be able to add some more color on that, but usually they're two independent domain controllers. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no worries. Full disclosure, I've known the company since day one. Okay. Do you find that people will replace their backup system or augment their backup system? So amongst my customer base, augment. Um, more and more we're seeing with organizations, um, they're displacing it. Um, in my customer base specifically, we've got a lot of customers, the insurance firm I mentioned earlier, um, are starting to displace uh, Veeam, and, and they've got two or three different backup products, like a lot of companies do. Um, so they're actually starting to, they've already weeded Veeam out of the, the SQL environment. We do both re, re, um, replication and long-term retention for that. Uh, and there was a big performance reason for that. Veeam just couldn't back up their SQL environment. Just, too much, too much oomph, a little too much horsepower. Um, and then now we're working our way into other parts of the environment where simply put, you know, Commvault's got a million features and is a great backup product. Would never tell you it's not. I've used it. I liked Commvault once it was set up. A little bit of a headache to set up. But I used like two things in Commvault. And I was paying for a million things. And for the most part, my customers who, this is the one I'm talking about in particular, they just need long-term retention for legal hold. You sue us, I got the data. That's it. Um, outside of that, they don't need a lot of this other stuff. They're not doing things like data classification, at least not with Commvault. They're doing it with Veronis, which, why well, I have two solutions to do one thing, you know? Well, can you collapse or, or consolidate the journal for long-term retention? So effectively with all long-term retention, basically what we do is we take an incremental mm -hmm. of the journal. Um, you could do a full copy clone of the journal if you really wanted to as well. We have some customers who do that. Um, but effectively what you're doing is just taking that incremental and you can, it's like any backup product. And I didn't mean to glaze over it, it's just, backup's not sexy. But um, it's, it's exact same as, as basically ever the product, except for the operation's different because we're doing it off our journal. So it's not during, it's not happening off the production environment. So it's not disrupted to the performance. There's really no window you have to hit. Um, so effectively you just say, hey, I want a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, quarterly, and, and we do the same thing. So I answer the same question as yeah. the margin. Have you replaced your monitoring? Have you yep. replaced all the other stuff we have too? Are you monitoring hell for the last three or four years? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my opinion. I, 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 you know, I, I'd like to tell you yes right off the bat. A lot of it depends on, on some of the things you're using and some of the things you're doing. Um, so, for, for instance, um, you know, V-Realize and V-Realize orchestration automation, there's some sandboxing stuff you can do in there that we're moving toward but we don't specifically have. And that's more of like the actual, not physical because it's logical, right? But logical sandboxing where we can provide all the same amount of data, but it's not one click. It takes a little bit more effort. Um, and then, you know, around cloud, a lot of times we're, we're firmly replacing, you know, a lot of those cloud-based solutions for cost estimation. The one thing we don't do yet is, hey, I have an EC2 instance of X. What's the utilization? Can I go down to from an M4 extra large to an M3? So, again, that's not something we have today. It's, we're moving in that direction. Yes, sir? So, if I do a DR failover and I'm running, say, the weekend or a whole week that we're running the DR site, mm -hmm. does Zerto have its fingers in the SAN replication to then replicate you back to the primary site? Yes, it's, it's all set up in Zerto. So, what you would do, and you know, a good example of one of my customers who's software development, they do A side, B side. Um, and basically, every six months, they go A side, they flip it over to the B side. And what they do is they set up reverse replication. So then the data is automatically being replicated back. When they're done, they usually do it because of some hardware stuff, and they do all kinds of out of my comfort zone. Um, when, they, when they want to go from B side to A side, that's six months later. They just do the, the same recovery process to the other side. It's a move operation, not a recovery process. But yeah. But Zergo has its fingers. Like exactly. Well, so we're not, we're not, we're, we're doing it through the hypervisor. So we're just, do, we're doing it at the VMware level. We don't have integration into the, the storage layer. So there's no need for like an SRA, like you would like with SRM or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So that also means that any guest initiated, uh, ISS initiated connections, you're not. 
So if you're up, if you're presenting storage through an iSCSI initiator, yeah. then no. Yeah. Um, but RDMs? Oh, God, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so it's a good thing you asked. First of all, why are you doing RDMs? I'm not. I'm using <laughs> Oh, damn it. Oh, man. Oh, no. Damn it. You got me there. You got me there. <laughs> no, so RDMs, it's funny. I only mention that because a lot of our customers who do RDMs, we can replicate an RDM to an RDM or an RDM to a VMDK. So a lot of our customers are actually starting to move away from RDMs over to, well, not starting to. They've been doing it for a while. But, yeah, the iSCSI initiator thing, unfortunately, is, is a limitation to us because it's obviously not being presented directly. The hypervisor's yeah. not Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. We do see that sometimes for, you know, for performance perspectives, but we're all seeing that change as well. Well, do you, do you integrate Microsoft SQL Server replication technologies and import them like you do at Oracle? Exactly. You yeah. do. Mm -hmm. so Exactly. 